Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Open Multi-Service Segregation at the Edge, sponsored by IP Infusion and UFI Space. Before we begin, I will cover a few housekeeping items. On the left-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, please type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if you don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource list widget. Near the end of today's presentation, please take one minute to complete the survey that's open on your screen. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heavy Reading Senior Principal Analyst, Sterling Perry. Hi, thank you, Barbara. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Open Multi-Service Aggregation at the Edge, uh, sponsored by IP Infusion and Eufy Space. And I will be the moderator for today's webinar and joined by two speakers, Kai Lee. He is the AVP of Technical Sales with Eufy Space and then welcoming back Shaji Nathan, who is Chief Product Officer from IP Infusion. So the combination of the three of us will take you through the next hour. Here's a look at the flow of the webinar. I'll introduce really with some market trends and just starting to touch on the, the role of disaggregation uh, and then I'll, I'll move over to my colleague on the webinar, Kai, who will cover the hardware perspective. And then we'll move through to the software side, the network operating system, uh, and Shaji will walk us through that. And we hope to have about 10 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers. So please ask questions electronically throughout as they, they come to you, and we'll be gathering them up and um, try to get through as many as we can. So in terms of, of the overall market drivers, and I want to address um, the access um, network from both the mobility side as well as the, the fixed network side. And I'll start with mobility. And of course, what's driving uh, mobility today is, is very much around uh, 5G. The data that's on this slide, it's actually a combination of, of research from our colleagues at Omdia, which does a lot of the forecasting within our, our group and um, also some data from Ericsson's mobility report. Um, but if you look at the subscriptions, uh, and that's the blue bars, uh, Omdia actually uh, counted over 500 million, half a billion subscribers for 5G at the end of um, 2021, at the end of last year. A lot of that driven by, by Asia, but certainly globally. And then the expectation Omdia forecasts over a billion 5G subscribers by the end of this year. So massive, massive growth. Uh, forecasted 55% CAGR um, compound annual growth rate through 2026, so pretty significant. On the data side, uh, and this is the Ericsson Mobility Report data, the orange line, uh, measuring in exabytes per month forecasting data traffic growth, uh, specifically from 5G, growing at a 77% compound annual growth rate. And this is really um, just a part of it and, and really just the beginning. The, the whole enterprise opportunity is really just starting to to play out now um, very much around the, the 5G advanced capabilities that um, have been ex sort of defined around release 18 of, of the 3G PP 5G standard, uh, as well as standalone 5G as being a requirement to unlock a lot of that um, enterprise opportunity. And standalone 5G is, is just starting now. So lots of growth already and lots of opportunity in mobility. If we look at um, the fixed network, that's not standing still uh, by any means either. This data also comes from our colleagues at Omdia, and it, it looks at um, uh, mobile broadband, um, fixed broadband subscriptions as well as, as the, um, average speeds. If you look at the top bars there, the, the, red, um, the red bars at the top, that's gigabit per second um, broadband subscription uh, greater than 1,000 megabits. And that made up about two, or, or currently makes up about 2% of um, global broadband subscriptions. It's expected to grow in this forecast to over 17% by 2025. So massive growth in, in high-speed broadband. Of course, the average speeds are not going to be gigabit. Uh, that's the blue line. But you can see that, that blue line of average um, 
download speeds you know, climbing significantly over the next five years as well to over um, 500 megabits by the end of this forecast period. Fiber is a, a huge enabler of both of, of moving to greater speeds. That's really the, the main technology enabler that um, lets operators, um, you know, move move to gigabit speeds and, and even even below. Um, but it's also interestingly enabler for for higher average revenue per user or, or ARPU. Um, research is showing that um, fiber deployments actually lead to an increase in, in ARPU, which of course is a very big deal. A lot of opportunity coming from, or as we move into the post-pandemic world, trends of work from home. I'm obviously working from home myself. Um, this stuff is all expected to continue. One interesting thing that, that we're seeing is a shift in the consumer focus um, away from, from a sharp focus on, on pricing um, and really moving towards um, greater speeds, but also um, Greater reliability is becoming a very important metric. Um, all, you know, really as we move into the post-COVID era of broadband, and, and our research is, is um, already starting to show this renewed or um, increased focus on the reliability side. Uh, so that's, you know, that's um, kind of a zoom in of the trend. If we zoom out a bit, it, it really gives us a, a clear and full picture of the situation that network operators face. Uh, we talk about, you know, gigabit and, and ultra high speed broadband. We talk about 5G, but those are a mix of, you know, or within the mix of services that network operators have. Uh, they have a lot of legacy services. Of course, they have a lot of legacy networks in mobility terms, you know, legacy generations of, of mobility. If you add those all up, um, the, the overall services revenue growth picture is not that strong. Um, Omdia forecast, which is shown here, predicts about a 1%, or if you look through this historical period through 2024, it's about a one, a little over 1% compound annual growth rate in revenue. Um, that becomes important because the revenue really is, is what the operators peg their CapEx total spend and CapEx growth to. And so when overall revenue growth is slow, they have to take that very constrained amount of CapEx and growth in CapEx and put it in the right places in the network invest in the right opportunities and of course fight, um, really um, align that with, um, with, align that with the opportunities and, and also focus on, on lowering total cost of ownership, lowering CapEx and OpEx as they deploy capital. Uh, and so the, the network um, requirements become scaling of course to meet, meet the bit demand, but also um, really pursuing those revenue growth opportunities and 5G and, and fixed broadband as I just talked about and also really focusing on, on keeping the cost down. Uh, moving into the topic of today's webinar, and um, I'm just gonna highlight it here and my colleagues will, will provide uh, the additional detail, but so where does disaggregation fit in given the, the big picture that I just talked about? Uh, this is a heavy reading survey we did uh, published in 2021. And we asked here, what are the top factors motivating uh, operators to to adopt this aggregation. And the results were really interesting because the initial focus on disaggregation, if we go back 10 years plus, was really on cost, cost, cost. What we're seeing here is, is a broader focus. And if you look at the top bars uh, in terms of the priorities that the chart is showing, cost isn't really even the primary one. It's in the mix, of course, but faster innovation and flexibility in adopting technologies and launching new services, increasing revenue um, are, are the top drivers. And then CapEx is important as well as, as um, decreasing vendor lock-in and you know, really increasing the, the vendor um, diversity in the networks are, are all uh, in the mix. If we kind of map those to the different um, opportunities and challenges that I just talked through, it's clear that operators are viewing disaggregation as a means to address both the opportunities and the challenges. And if we had to weight it, it looks like they're really pursuing the opportunities to a greater degree um, than, than the cost challenge. But, uh, but clearly they're, they're all in the mix. Um, I haven't defined disaggregation here. Um, Kai, who I'm gonna bring in now, is gonna talk more on the definitions and then um, really get into the role of disaggregation uh, as it relates to the, the access and aggregation networks that we're gonna talk through. 
Kai, I will bring you in right now to continue, and, and I'll move to your first slide here. Great. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everyone. This is Kai Lee with UFI Space, uh, located here in San Jose, California. Um, want to uh, reiterate, uh, you know, from some of the um, uh, 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 driving force of the uh, aggregation, the adaptation to the new technology is certainly one of the things that uh, continue to drive this uh, motivation. So what we are seeing here and also what we are working with our customer is pro you know, the architecture from the traditional vendor, what we call the uh, vendor lock system, which uh, traditionally you will go to a vendor, they will provide you three things, you know, the uh, hardware, the software, and also the uh, uh, service contract uh, and maintenance. And those things are tightly locked. And then that pre one of the things that prevent uh, the end user like yourself is uh, if you want to add a new feature or some of those things, it goes through a pretty uh, interesting process. And by decoupling of those uh, in a disaggregating um, uh, environment and basically the time to market with the new feature uh, increase uh, in the software or hardware, we can uh, make it happen a lot faster. So this is one of the things that can uh, match with the survey that you saw in the uh, previous slide. So with that, um, I'd like to kind of show the audience uh, with a reference architecture on a typical uh, service provider environment from the left to the right. And basically, you have the user uh, uh, equipment like your uh, cell phone or uh, 5G devices typically connecting to a cell tower versus at home, if you have a residential broadband or some of these newer, uh, what they call the 5G home, the fixed uh, wireless uh, that you can use today in some of the carrier. And from that, that ties into the uh, radio unit and also the baseband unit eventually that goes into uh, like a cell site gateway, going through the metro ethernet into an uh, aggregation and before they hit the central office. So this is kind of a fairly, uh, uh, typical design of the uh, uh, telco reference architecture. And what we are focusing today uh, with our partner, software partner from IPI, is to discuss the architecture of how we can decouple some of this functionality. And again, going back, you know, from what the survey actually confirmed is uh, more than half of the uh, users, end users are looking at doing so, so that they can innovate come to market and uh, feature new feature requests much quicker than, you know, the usual tradition. And we're going to be focusing on the uh, 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 multi-surface application uh, with respect to the uh, application uh, on the central one. And uh, usually, um, if you kind of go back to, like, Network Design 101, whenever we add another layer uh, between the central office and the edge, like the cell tower, in this case with the aggregation, uh, the whole idea is really trying to increase the scalability. Think about this. We probably have tens and thousands of residential and cell tower coming into maybe a couple hundred central offices. So having an aggregation layer in between, and basically that will add another layer of scalability so we can home all these devices into the uh, smaller number of central offices in a very uh, timely arrangement. So this is the piece that we're going to focusing on, along with some of the features, software feature set from our software partner with uh, IPI. So using the previous slide with the uh, reference architecture, allow me to start with this uh, kind of like a traditional uh, network using some of the uh, uh, OEM chassis based that uh, tightly locked between the hardware and software, uh, they all bundled together. Um, you're kind of looking at this is the axis, aggregation, edge, and core. It's kind of what we call the place of the network. And, uh, you know, sometimes you hear the term loosely uh, as the front hall, the mid hall, and the back hall kind of mapped into this architecture. Um, the design is actually okay, except the individual components on each pieces of this network are tightly coupled, uh, you know, from the software and the hardware feature set. So that doesn't leave the uh, uh, end user with too much uh, flexibility, but rather than they are being driven uh, by the vendor who provides you this uh, hardware and software solution. So with the disaggregation, what, the picture kind of looks like this. We still follow the same uh, places of the network, the access, aggregation, edge, and core on the bottom. That whole idea of the architecture stay the same, but the component of each one of those uh, domains, uh, we 
aggregate them, uh, we disaggregate them in uh, by decoupling from the hardware and software. And then that kind of let the end user to do two things. Uh, now they can pick and choose some of the open standard hardware platform and then using the specific uh, software vendor of their choice to port onto the top uh, of the uh, open hardware. And one thing I do want to kind of emphasize why this is becoming increasingly important is because software nowadays have become a lot more uh, software defined as part of the uh, SDN uh, trend and the SDN architecture. So with a lot of these uh, uh, software defined approach on the software, having an open uh, uh, hardware platform using uh, standard merchant silicon solution rather than a closed end ASIC from a specific vendor, that gives the software provider tremendous amount of flexibility uh, to port their software with the specific feature set that the carrier that they might need in terms of, uh, you know, what feature set they, they need and, uh, you know, continue to maximize the uh, software-defined network capability, which the trend has been going on for a long time. So this is kind of how we do this uh, together. So from the left to the right, this is kind of the business model. You know, we decouple our uh, white box hardware based on, uh, we call it white boxes because it's based on generic merchant silicon. And we couldn't do this thing like five or 10 years ago and we can do it today. And it has a lot to do because the merchant silicon uh, has really catch up and their performance, uh, you know, are basically are catching up with some of the uh, ASIC, the application specific IC, you know, from a few years ago. So, so the performance, you know, the uh, a throughput and the feature set, you know, they are really catching up with the traditional ASIC. So by decoupling the standard platform on the generic merchant silicon hardware and the software, so in the middle, what we are showing is kind of the model, you know, uh, having the merchant silicon being the foundation, and then we have the open network software, like such as our partner from IP Infusion, they can port on top. And then we have all the different modules, and usually nowadays with the SDN approach, a lot of these uh, network operating, operating system architecture is what we call the uh, modular design, and you plug in the different module on top of it. So in this case, we are showing like the routing modules or the uh, provider edge module. So, you know, if I might give an example, if you are routing both OSPF and BGP together on the same hardware platform, you need to fix the bug on OSPF. You actually can bring down the module, patch the bug, but without bringing down the entire kernel, so your your BGP is still functioning while you are trying to fix uh, the OSC, OSPF module. So this is one of the benefits by, you know, uh, taking this approach. And last but not the least, on the top is the SDN controller uh, or the orchestrator. And that is, and with the size of a typical uh, telco network, with thousands or tens of thousands of devices, and and using the SDN approach, uh, no, the operator are no longer configuring these devices one by one, but rather than using an SDN controller approach, or sometimes we are known as the orchestrator. So we set the profile and then we push it down uh, using some of the standard like, uh, you know, the RESTful API or some of those other uh, standard interfaces that you define on the controller, you schedule them and you push the configuration specifically to those locations of your network devices. And it makes the ease of uh, provisioning and ease of uh, management. And last but not the least, uh, we are very... Uh, uh, pleased to uh, partner with uh, a lot of these North, uh, North provider and uh, certainly uh, IP Infusion is one of the Thai partners that we are doing this on the model I just explained. And then putting everything together, we talk about the traditional architecture as a, as a reference, then we plug in the uh, OEM vendor design, uh, which basically we call it the uh, hardware and software bundle, and then we go into the same uh, model, but decouple the hardware and software separately, and we talk about the benefit. And now I want to bring all the pieces to get together with all the physical boxes that we are actually uh, building along with IPI. And basically, what we are doing is uh, uh, what we are doing here is uh, introduce a couple uh, devices here, and these are all based on the. Uh, merchant silicon from Broadcom, which happens to be uh, one of the leaders on the uh, merchant silicon. And we are using uh, uh, their DNX family. And what we are sharing today that focusing on the application module 
is their Kumon 2C. And then on the picture, we show a couple platform as an example, how we build to aggregate like the cell tower, like the home office, like the residential connection, like the ONT or the GPOM together, aggregating them into this uh, Q2C platform. We listed a couple different model here. And basically in a nutshell, with the same merchant silicon Q2C, we can build different port density that we can subdivide them into 100K, uh, 100 gig focus or 25 gig focus or even 100 gig high density focus by using dual of the Q2C. Uh, keep one thing in mind, uh, most of the telco requirement would like to see what they call the non-blocking solution. So some of these devices in the aggregation layer, we are using a single Q2C chipset, and some we use the dual Q2C because we are providing high density of 100 gig uh, connection, and we want to preserve those uh, as a uh, non-blocking architecture. And all in all, these are the few boxes uh, with their specification. And first of all, Q2C is a, uh, uh, from a semiconductor uh, manufacturing perspective, this is a 16 nanometer technology as compared to some of the older generation uh, like the QAX and the QAMX family, those are the 28 uh, nanometer. Uh, this one is a 16 nanometer. And you would expect this number to continue to go down uh, for some of the newer chip, you know, uh, that we are building the other devices for the central office. Uh, but to stay with this one with the 16 nanometer, so why do you care as a, as an operator or as an end user? Because the, the smaller the uh, nanometer technology, uh, it brings in a lot of benefit. If I can summarize, there are two benefits that actually impact you as the uh, end uh, user to, to deploy this. Uh, one is with the smaller nanometer, in this case the 60 nanometer, uh, the merchant silicon can pack a lot more uh, devices, uh, you know, the, the different gates, uh, transistor into the uh, wafer resulting into a lot more feature set and a lot more processing power that you can get on the same uh, chip with the same amount of service area. And the second thing, which is also very important, the smaller the nanometer, the lower the power consumption uh, the chip will require so we can save costs not only on the power, but the heat dissipation and all that. And with that, what we are showing here are three devices. The Q2C has a 2.4 terabit per second switching fabric. And we try to design all these things, uh, stay with the non-blocking or very close to a non-blocking architecture. The middle one with the 64, we label them as the 4.8 because in some cases, with the higher density of the 100 gate requirement by some carrier, uh, we are using a dual chipset design with two Q2C back to back. And the last but not the least on the right hand side, we are building the same thing but focusing on the 24, uh, the 25 uh, gate connection for some of the, uh, like the G Palm or some of the uh, 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 home residential connection that require 25 gate instead of 100 gate. And last but not the least, there are a couple uh, feature set that we build on top by leveraging the uh, advanced uh, merchant silicon. And the one that I want to call out is the time synchronization. Uh, we are uh, focusing a lot on the time synchronization because it's a telco environment uh, uh, you, with this called the PTT, Precision Timing Protocol, uh, the IEEE 1588 version two. So we partner with uh, the solution from Microchip and MicroSemi, and we support uh, such a PTT across the entire network including with the uh, uh, aggregation devices that we build with the uh, Q2C platform. So that kind of wrap up with the summary. So what we did was we went through from a reference architecture all the way into the specific devices down to the merchant silicon level and why the benefit that we pick a certain chipset uh, is uh, relevant to the end user in terms of the uh, processing, in terms of the uh, heat dissipation, and also the power consumption. So with that, I will turn over to my partner uh, from IPI, and then uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Kay. Uh, so, uh, hi, this is Shaji Nathan, and uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer at IP Infusion. IP Infusion has been in business for almost 20 years, bringing in cutting-edge solutions in controlled data plane and management plane software. And uh, we have over 500 plus customers with 
tens of thousands of deployment in uh, um, array of uh, network equipment uh, that covers all the way from home gateways all the way to uh, multi uh, terabit systems. So uh, I would talk about the software perspective of what Kay just outlined and uh, um, how how we plan on actually addressing some of the challenges that stem from that uh, multi-service provider edge. So uh, uh, going back to that reference architecture that uh, Kay outlined in his uh, diagram, one of the things that stand out is you notice that at the access side, the speeds are increasing. Earlier, it used to be a gigabit pod. Uh, if you take a broadband service like a passive optical network, now it's scaling up to 10 gigabit with XGS pod, symmetrical pod, and uh, going all the way to 40 gigabits with the next generation of pod technologies. Likewise, uh, uh, we also want to uh, scale the capacity on the cable networks, as well as on the DSL networks, as well as uh, basically, on the wireless side, uh, you know, wireless broadband, fixed broadband, as well as uh, basically mobile. So here, the radio capacities are increasing with uh, from 4G to 5G transition happening. Um, you see um, decomposition of the radio network itself. Basically, the baseband is now becoming uh, more packet oriented, and it is distributed across uh, with the new 5G architecture. So as you see, uh, there is a plethora of things going on at the at edge, uh, the access side. So what happens is basically the aggregation side now comes into focus because this travels the boundary between your transport network, your core, and um, if you just think about your daily habits, right? When you use that application on your phone, chances are you're basically fetching data from the left side of the network to the right side uh, because you're accessing some kind of an application. So essentially what happens is as you as more and more devices start coming in, the bandwidth needs increase and the complexity here increases because now you have to scale from uh, what used to be gigabit capacity to terabit scale. That is just the speed aspect of it. Uh, for a network administrator, you know this is a unique challenge, right? On the one hand, you basically have this uh, bandwidth constant bandwidth demands and plus um, you have to roll out new services to keep up with the competition. So as new services are coming in, you need a seamless way to interwork with that existing equipment. And 90% uh, of the time, the networks are, it's not like a one size fits all kind of approach. But uh, there are different cost considerations for uh, different geographies in terms of uh, the average revenue per user, if you're looking at uh, a cell site, for instance. And if you're looking at broadband, there are other cost uh, um, equations that come into play. So how do we actually interwork, right, with the existing topology that you already have? Because there is a mix and match of protocols there at that provider edge. You basically, it can be anywhere from carrier ethernet, various generations of carrier ethernet, all the way from 2.0 to 3.0. And then uh, looking at the transport side, you basically have a gamut of technologies. Like if you take uh, IP um, routing, um, multiple multi-protocol routing there, in terms of ISIS, OSPF, BGP, and if you look at uh, MPLS alone, there are multiple signaling parameters, right? Uh, you have LDP-based signaling, RSVP-based signaling. Now, lately, segment routing coming into the picture, then segment routing V6 coming into the picture, and now to scale capacity, you need to bring in new optics. And with that, you know, you're know scaling from 10 gigabit to 100 to 400 gigabit and 800 and beyond. Now, the the good news is you have a lot of innovation happening on the cord silicon. The switching speeds are increasing. And basically with the new nanometer density coming in from a cost, uh, cost per bit standpoint, you know, you get a plethora of new network silicon coming into the picture. Likewise for optics, you basically have uh, different form factors coming in, pluggable ones that can plug right into that provider edge device of yours. Uh, so the ZR, new standards like ZR and ZR plus coming in. Now, with that comes complexity associated with it. So as a network administrator, you start thinking, how do I actually bring all these elements uh, and take advantage of all these innovations, basically? So hardware is one aspect of it. I'll talk about the software aspect. Now that I've laid out uh, 
uh, basically what a multi-service access and aggregation and transport looks like. Uh, let me go on to address what are the things that you really need. So you need a operating system that can actually keep pace with both with the existing technologies that you currently have so that you can seamlessly introduce as and when you need a network element to scale up in capacity, be it at the access or at the transport side or at the aggregation side. You basically need that operating system to be able to interwork with your existing device. That's on day one operation to offer the same kind of services with scale and capacity. So uh, there are a few requirements that actually come in. You need to be able to take in multiple kinds of data plane, right? Um, so it could be a fixed pipeline switch, which scales in capacity from terabit um, scale, right? And uh, it could be a programmable one, or it could be a mix of both programmable as well as a fixed pipeline. By that, what I mean is like fixed function switches, which do uh, things uh, that are actually built into, pre-built into silicon, and you can't actually change it. But then there is the network silicon that where you can, some aspects of it are programmable. So when a new protocol comes in, you can fit in a new encapsulation type, for instance. Quality of service, uh, basically adding um, new bells and whistles to existing services. So in order to do that, you know, you need a data plane that basically is built on hardware abstraction, which means that it presents a consistent interface to the control plane protocols that are operating. The control plane is the guts of the system because this is where your routing happens, uh, interworking happens here. Your MPLS, for instance, right? All the services basically uh, come into play. Um, so routing switching, L2, L2, routing, L2 switching, MPLS switching, IP routing, and then getting into uh, the newer forms of uh, way of collapsing the network, basically bringing the control plane, uh, taking out all the complexity from the control plane. Like for instance, decoupling state information from the network. Like current networks basically which are signaling heavy carry a lot of state information. So things like convergence become an issue as you're working on very high capacity devices. So you need that capability there built into that. So the control plane has to be versatile has to be modular in nature, needs to be able to interwork with your existing network and also take you to that next level of network transition. Then you need a software abstraction on top because as the network administration teams are becoming more capable, basically there might be newer applications that you that we haven't thought of as a service pro, as a software service vendor. We might not have thought of it, but you have a unique need and you have a silicon that is programmable. So you need to be able to have some kind of a container, just like your uh, cell phone model, where you can actually plan to do some things by yourself that is unique for your network. So we have to have some kind of capability here, as a software abstraction for not just for operating system vendors like us, but also for third party vendors, independent system vendors who basically want to bring in new things. For instance, uh, if I want to add a microwave um, element to to an existing router, right? Or to add an OLT interface, basically based on, because these new pluggable form factors are becoming possible now. So how do I do that? I need some kind of a software abstraction that actually works with this data plane and makes this new service that is plugging in into the data plane look as a part of this overall operating system. So you need to have that ability, some kind of container where you can park in third party application. Now to cap it all, you need a management plane that management plane that manages this disparate uh, set of hardware, right? Because you've got uh, vertical uh, disaggregation as well as horizontal disaggregation where the components, the DSP may come from somebody else. The uh, Basically the operating system comes from a vendor like us. And uh, now how do I, and the uh, hardware basically comes from somebody like you, space. So how do I actually bring that in and operationalize this into the network? I need a consistent interface, management interface. And that has to be uh, automation capable, just like you roll in services today in other domains, in the application domain, you need to be able to uh, roll the network services as well. So you need, uh, at the very basic instance, you need a command line interface. You basically need a model-driven architecture. So a netconf, open config, these are models that are there. So these are the three key aspects from a management plane from a software abstraction and a hardware abstraction. So uh, these are the things that uh, we bring together 
at IPI. So what do we do? We bring this in Ocnos as a open compute network operating system that we bring in for terabit scale switching. So essentially uh, it supports a wide variety of silicon, um, be it from Broadcom, Marvel, Intel, any future uh, capable you know, chipsets that are coming in. And it can even run on the standard CPU or a GPU for instance, to do the acceleration. Uh, and it comes with a full suite of routing protocols, uh, all the way from uh, arcane protocols like ISIS, OSPF, BGP, and uh, MPLS, with all the signaling elements like LDP, RSVP signaling, segment routing, um, basically interworking between segment routing and MPLS uh, routing, and uh, SRV6 capable. Um, so if you have a network silicon that is SRV6 capable, like the Qumran 2C, that my colleague just introduced, you'll be able to actually use that same network element and go from today to tomorrow. Essentially interwork with come in on day one, add scale and capacity. And then on day two, basically you can start rolling services as and when you feel comfortable. And over time, you can actually change your transport technology with that same network silicon. And the same operating system can basically work across the board all the way from access right into the data center. So the beauty here is basically you get the benefits of multi-vendor uh, capabilities in terms of innovation, in terms of silicon, in terms of uh, new breakthroughs in software engineering as well. And on top of that, it allows you to innovate as well, basically customize it as per your needs. Now, network automation is a key aspect of it. Now we are getting, uh, these networks are basically, you want to think of it like a time series kind of a device, which is constantly giving you lots of packet metadata. From that, you can glean a lot of intelligence, right? But in order to do that, the devices need to be capable of exporting this at a very high rate, because now we are talking about networks that are going from 10 gigabit all the way to 400 gigabit in terms of port speeds and 800 in the near future. So as you look at it, the packet metadata that comes in has to be streamed, right? The, the polling mechanism doesn't work. The SNMP doesn't scale. So you need newer ways that uh, instrumentation where you can actually feed it into a big data kind of uh, data lake, for instance. So you need uh, um, analytics to be working on top of it, being able to do some kind of predictive analytics, right? Because now you have all this data, you can get a lot of insights from it. So newer uh, paradigms like machine learning, for instance, in order to be able to do that, you need uh, that infra right infrastructure in place, right at the operating system level, as well as at the network management layer. So uh, basically you need the OAM layer to be very robust. So streaming telemetry becomes a very important aspect of it. Then correlating between events, right? You have this disparate set of devices that are coming in. So and now the um, troubleshooting gets uh, pretty complicated very quickly. So in order to do that, how can we lessen that impact? What we provide is basically a natural language based search uh, based uh, logging system, which basically allows you to work just like you work with Google today to get an insight, right? You can actually do the searches on the log, a Splunk-like interface, basically coming into the network itself. And on top of that, you can add any kind of third party analytics tool on top of this uh, data lake that you already built. And a service integration bus so that you can add in new applications. Basically, optimization application, for instance, like bandwidth on demand, for instance. Let's say your network is very unique to you and you have some security element that you want to bring into focus. So you could do so by plugging in on top, on top of this management layer here uh, with the service integration bus. And you have the appropriate domain controller because as I alluded to in the previous slides, you basically have a confluence of things happening, right? On the radio side, a portion of the baseband is basically now getting attached to this device. So you have radio transport coming in on one side. On the other side, you have this optical transport. So now you have multiple domains now converging into a single platform, like the platform that, uh, um, uh, the Q2C platform that um, uh, Kay mentioned a little while ago. So in order to do that multi-domain control, you need a Con, uh, domain controller that basically can control that multiple domains converging onto that single platform. And on top of that, you need an analytics layer and a network automation service, right? So service orchestration. So with this multiple domains, 
uh, as a network administrator, you want your tasks to be much more simpler. So you want to be able to define this at a higher level. So newer paradigms like Tosca basically are coming in. That has to be uh, working seamlessly with existing um, network management layers, right? With the existing data models that you currently have in your network. So you need a, a layer of, uh, you know, service automation basically that comes in and plugs right into this new network element. So on day one, you can manage that new network element and still get a single pane of glass, right? You already have an, um, a device that is already element management system that is already managing your existing network. So you need some way to plug into this new system that is coming in so that you get an insight. So we provide the, that capability as well. Um, not just the operating system, but the software to manage this new paradigms. So um, how does this all come together? So let me give you a practical use case, right? Um, taking this uh, UFI Space 9600 router. So what we have done here is this is an actual deployment use case that we have uh, validated, tested, and it's uh, being rolled out into a network. Essentially, in this case, uh, the service provider basically had a mix of 4G, multiple generations of radios on the tower. So 4G mainly. So on day one, the necessity was to increase the scale and capacity of that network so that it becomes 5G ready. Then over time, what they want to do is to bring in 5G uh, uh, radios basically on that tower. So here, uh, 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 the first uh, uh, order of business is to basically bring in this SIPRI radio that is already there. And they want to actually have a mix of uh, distributed units, a BBU sitting right at the edge of the tower as well as with the new paradigm where the DU itself is basically sitting somewhere here. So this becomes almost like a mid-hall component. So essentially you have a front hall gateway that is capable of taking in both the eCIPRI for 5G and CIPRI for LTE, uh, that is the existing network. So a mix of timing and synchronization, right? So with uh, 5G, you basically have much more stricter requirements in terms of timing. And for 4G, it has to interoperate with that old old fashioned radio. So essentially you have this front hall gateway that gets aggregated here and that gets plugged into an existing network and that existing network is today is IP MPLS based. So it's running seamless MPLS and essentially they want to actually cut over from RSVP based signaling today. They want to decongest the network, basically being a flatter control plane. So on day one, what we provide is RSVP, uh, LDP based signaling because they've got multiple sites with different kinds of um, transport. So we accommodate that on this particular platform. Then the next uh, next part of the uh, network iteration is basically the control plane protocols get flattened. So um, at some point in time, you know, it becomes uh, SRV4 capable. So what we plan on doing is basically just turn off some of the services and reconfigure this uh, device here, basically to do uh, interworking with that uh, LDP, with the P router that is in the network. And uh, then from there, the third part of the network transition is when they want to run SRV6, when they decommission uh, some of the older generation of the radios, they want to go SRV6 end to end. So we are ready, um, so we start from day one, basically taking in, adding scale and capacity, and then bringing in the 5G network element, adding in services uh, using EVP and virtualization services, right? So. Um, First, it starts out with a standard VPLS, VPWS, um, L2, L3 VPN. Basically, these are the three constructs here. And then over time, we basically add in the uh, signaling where uh, you know we make it uh, SRV4 capable, and then SRV6, where you run IPv6 end to end. So this is one example of practical considerations uh, that we take into account using our operating system on a third-party hardware and basically interworking with all the network service components that are there. And uh, so with that, uh, I want to basically um, reiterate what we bring to the table. Basically features in terms of common software platform that I uh, outlined, hardware abstraction, programmability for you to innovate and simplify it. Basically, uh, as networks are not one size fits all, there are uh, multiple considerations there. So we support a wide variety of hardware and the management plane basically becomes very important. So the simplification through network automation, open architecture, it's built on open standards, IETF, IEEE, OIF uh, compliant. And de-risking it, we provide um, after sales service and support, which basically you come to expect from a new EM. So uh, bringing new technologies in, 
without having to risk everything in your network. So that actually plays down to that CapEx and OpEx uh, that uh, um, you know uh, Sterling mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So with that, I hand it over to you, Sterling. All right, excellent. Thanks, Shaji, and thank you, Kai. Uh, great presentation. So we do have about 15 minutes left for, for Q&A, and we do have some questions in. I'll start going through those, but uh, for the audience, if you have some questions as um, in addition here, now's the time to ask them. Um, let me start. Uh, I guess uh, I'll start with Kai. Um, a question about um, the, the, um, the the hardware platform, the S9600, um, that you highlighted in the presentation. Um, other than what was presented, are there other use cases for that type of hardware platform? Kai, are you able to address that? Uh, yes. The uh... As the title uh, of the uh, webinar today, we call it the uh, multi-service uh, aggregation. So the box is actually, you know, mainly designed for aggregation. Aggregation is a very uh, interesting char characteristic layer. Uh, usually, looking for very high density, somewhat low cost type of devices so that you can do the scalability that I talked about earlier. That is the, the one thing. So to answer your question of the uh, use case, uh, we the multi surface piece that we talk about today are some of the examples that we show. Not only we are focusing on the homing the five G or the four uh, G LTE, but also some of the uh, residential connection, the uh, uh, BNG, the fiber broadband, and all that. And that kind of you know do the, uh, make it kind of like a, a multi surface type of environment. And that goes back to the uh, use utilizing the uh, merchant silicon. Another use case to answer the question that you just bring up is. Uh, at the picture, we show this is a one single layer design of the uh, uh, application, and usually that was uh, the purpose is to home tens and thousands of residential or cell tower into maybe a couple hundred central offices, you know, kind of environment. But to take it to the next step, we actually can design this with a two tier using a spine and a leaf with a, uh, a hub. Uh, layer or a spine uh, layer of the aggregation uh, devices using the same Q2C technology like 100 gig and then the leaf uh, using the 25 gig. So now all of a sudden we have a two tier design of the aggregation and we can take the scalability to the next uh, level. And the beauty of that approach is a play as you go model. I can start with a single layer and then if I scale to a certain point, I can add the uh, that's the uh, spine and the leaf layer, and then I can continue increase my leaf, and then uh, when we get to a certain limit, I can increase the spine as well to make this thing uh, very scalable. And that goes back to the flexibility of the you know this whole uh, open disaggregated design is a pay as you go, and then uh, we make it ex extremely flexible uh, from a topology perspective for the. Uh, operator to, you know, uh, go from the initial stage uh, all the way into as the business they, uh, they grow. So those are the two or three examples I want to highlight. All right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question refers to a specific slide. Let me see if I can push it. It says slide 18, which I believe is this one. Uh, and the, yeah, and the question is, um, and it's referencing the 9600, uh, although Shaji, you presented, so I guess I'll, I'll give you first shot at this one. Why are you distinguish? Why are you distinguishing between the 9600 aggregation routers and a provider edge router, which is also being shown? And I guess the the real question here is, how do you distinguish between a provider provider edge router and the and the 9600? You know, the aggregation router role. Yeah. That, um, that, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that is that's a good question. It's basically, you know, the same device uh, for some carriers, you know, depending upon the scale and capacity, uh, you know, that that 9600 could very well be the provider edge router. And in some cases, it could be the P router. If you look at the higher end models that are not yet um, out on the Qumran 2C platforms, right? Basically, in terms of capacity, they can actually scale up quite significantly. So um, it's just a basic terminology like uh, it's what the tip uses 
but as far as a software vendor is concerned you know essentially we do not see the distinction we just see a raw platform in terms of scale and capacity um uh, just to uh, reiterate what k just said right the same platform like i could basically make it into a broadband network gateway right or it could basically become like a microwave aggregation device for instance like we have been doing that even on the earlier versions of kumran um what you could do is basically have a radio management application and then connect a microwave radio to it so essentially it looks like a extension of that device so in terms of uh, provider edge versus aggregation you know we don't make a distinction per se from a software vendor standpoint it's basically just uh, the terminology that actually comes in but uh, no there is no distinction actually i don't okay. make a clear distinction in terms of hardware because as All a right. pure play software vendor you know we can pretty much uh, turn on functions depending upon the underlying hardware's capability all right excellent um kai i don't know if you had anything to add on the yeah. on the hardware side uh go yes ahead. yes i do um uh, may, maybe could you go back to the slides so the audience can follow oh, yeah, what well i'm done. about Sorry to say about that. okay so 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 basically the secret sauce is in the software if i give you a box with a certain merchant silicon uh you know the software is a secret sauce to make it a aggregation versus a provider edge um you know that you know kind of make the distinction but the one thing i really want to call out why we kind of call this thing out separately is this concept called the separation of services uh doing a network design you know as one of the thing on the bottom actually is on the bottom on this slide here we distinguish the access the application and then the transport uh, which is the provider edge and uh you know the the p node so at the aggregation we we do this thing as the concept of the separation of services is once you know you go into the day 2 after the design after the installation you go into the day 2 support and the operation this concept by separating these boxes uh devices physically uh if the budget allow and all that it just make the operation folks a lot easier to manage so i'll give you a very specific example provider edge usually is sitting at the edge of the mpls backbone uh you know if i can use uh, mpls as an example so it's doing a route with the distribution between mpls and bgp and then the aggregation you, and, and and the provider edge usually needs a little bit more higher processing with a tcam table to cache all the bgp route if you do a full table exchange and you probably have hundreds or even thousands of access control lists that you need to manage at the acl at the provider edge at the aggregation is a little bit easier because my job is to introduce another layer so i can home tens and thousands of cell tower into maybe a couple hundred central offices so so the the configuration on the application layer might not be as complex uh, in terms of like access controllers and all these other thing and that's why when we build a provider edge devices we build in a tcam hardware uh along with the uh uh control plane uh, i'm sorry with the uh, data plane but at the application the tcam is actually optional certain carrier say i really don't have that much to cash at the aggregation because i let the provider edge layer to do that so the tcam hardware we make it optional so that is another perspective so if i can summarize it two things one is the separation of surface to make things easier after the uh, day 2 support uh you know and certainly to reiterate what ipi just said the secret sources in the software i can make the same box to look like a application versus a uh 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 provider edge and uh, so that that's kind of the positioning uh and the color i like to add a little bit so back to you sterling right. yep thank you we've got uh, about 5 minutes left so let me just see if we can get through a couple more here um what one of them I- i'll comment quickly and then it will lead into a another question that we might want to elaborate on but somebody was asking about the market share of you know white box switch router compared to incumbent i don't have the the number um in front of me but but it is quite small this this is new architecture new new type of product that that's coming into market the vast majority is still non white box deployments today um across the different segments uh, i think our presenters would would agree with that the the question um that's in that somewhat relates is what are the benefits of a disaggregated uh, approach versus the the incumbent vendors i mean a lot of this 
you know, we have an incumbent uh, or traditional way of doing things. Disaggregation is new. There has to be a set of benefits if you weigh one work versus the other. What 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 are the top ones that customers are are identifying uh, when when you talk to them? I don't know Shaji or Kai who wants to take it, but the question on benefits comparison. Sure, from a software, uh, from a hardware piece. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. There'll be both. We'll do Saji and then then uh, Shaji and then Kai. All right, Shaji. Okay. Uh, from a software vendor standpoint, you know what we see is like uh, newer services, right? Um, and then basically the next thing that comes in is how can I actually interwork with my existing services? So service innovation, I would say, is the key benefit because you know you're getting both the vertical as well as horizontal disaggregation of components, right? and newer capable hardware coming in, which allows you to do a lot more things on that network device than what was possible. To give you an example, right? I can take that optical, uh, that switch and basically plug in uh, something like a Tibet module on an existing switch if the power and the cooling considerations allow me and convert that switch into uh, basically uh, 128 uh, you know, home uh, OLD device. Basically that wasn't possible before. Now this is possible, right? And uh, that disaggregation actually kind of helps you. Whereas uh, from an OEM, they basically have a fixed line, but OEMs can also uh, pretty much do the same thing. But with disaggregation, you know, you get a whole host of things that you can bring in very quickly and solve a particular problem. So I think that is basically the key thing. And the uh, cost is a consideration as more uh, network silicon comes into, uh, cord silicon comes in, uh, the cost over time will fall down, uh, exactly like what we have seen in the data center use case. So I would say service innovation first and uh, followed by cost. All right, excellent. Kai, you want to add from hardware? Sure. I think we had two minutes left, so I'll try to do this in one minute. Uh, basically, um, the whole idea with this, uh, this aggregated benefit is we want to provide a common open uh, hardware uh, environment with the advance of the merchant silicon that is available today. As I mentioned, you know, this kind of architecture might not happen five or ten years ago, but the merchant silicon today is powerful enough to do so. And by having this uh, open uh, uh, foundation, this strap layer, the software vendor can come in and be creating many, many different features on top. Uh, this might or might not be a very good example, but I still kind of want to use it. Is uh, every time I think about the public cloud, you know, you can go, you can subscribe this from your public cloud provider. You can provision like a virtual firewall, a, even a virtual switch, you know, on a generic, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, very powerful processor. And those processors are no longer ASIC specific, you know. So so it's kind of like going in that. Uh, trend with the SDN that we talked about earlier today. So having an open foundation, if I can summarize it, open having an open foundation and letting our software partner to be as creative as possible, you know, from an SDN type of architecture. And I really think uh, we can take this, uh, you know, pretty far with this uh, open architecture. All right, and we are coming very close to the top of the hour. Um, I don't know. Uh, that we have time. Well, maybe uh, very quickly, uh, like a, a 60 second, and I think it would go to Shaji. Um, in terms of lowering the cost, you did mention uh, benefits there. How does the, the common software uh, architecture drive down a TCO? What are, what are the different costs reduced? And it's going to be, I guess, more of just of, of a, a checklist rather than an elaboration because we just got one minute, but maybe hit that one, Shaji. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, you know, uh, being able to come up with an open uh, configuration model, right? Uh, basically, being able to use a single pane of glass to bring in this new service innovation, so that lowers your opex because you have to bring this new service in at a cheaper, better, faster rate, right? So, I would say, uh, basically, that is the primary consideration. Having the same operating system across the board to solve the problem from one edge of the network to the other edge of the network. And being able to bring in diverse set of hardware using, um, you don't have to learn new things again and again, and essentially work with what you already have. So that lowers your OPEX basically. All right, excellent. That we are right at the top of the hour, so we'll close out there. There should be a survey popped up for the audience. If you can just take a moment to fill out the survey, let us know what you thought. 
uh, before you close out. And with that, we are going to close the webinar. Thank you to Shaji and IP Infusion and, and Kai and, and Yuffie Space for sponsoring. And of course, thank you to the audience for tuning in today. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.